All right, folks, thanks for tuning back in. Um, today, I figured I'd do a little bit of a, um, a commonly asked question. I'd cover a really broad and big topic that I could probably do 20 episodes on. But, uh, and that subject is soundboards and what they are, um, how they contribute to the tone of the instrument, and what some of the really popular species are that we use for soundboards on acoustic guitars, and I think more importantly, why. Um, so let's cover what a soundboard is. Um, the soundboard is the top of the guitar. You'll sometimes re have it referred to as the top or the face plate. Um, but soundboard is a term that I use and it's a term that many, many, many people use in this business and, and, and I would recommend that that's how you use it as well. The reason it's the soundboard, I assume, is uh, the reason we came to that term is because the vast majority of the sound of your acoustic instrument comes from the top. I'd say probably north of 80% of the sound that you hear on your acoustic guitar comes from the top. The back and sides, I usually like to tell folks, are the spices. The top is the actual, you know, if you're cooking meat, this is the meat. The back and sides would just be the spices. They give you a little bit of that extra flavor. And you can use it to, the back and sides, to round out the tone in a way that you want. But today we're focusing on the top. And uh, so what makes a good top wood or a soundboard for an acoustic guitar? Well, something you need to remember on steel string, flat top acoustic instruments especially, um, is how they generate sound. You know, we've got this soundboard that's glued to the sides, the strings come down and they are anchored into the top via a bridge. And when you pluck that string, you have a very finite amount of energy that is being generated. The vast majority of that energy is being wasted into heat that just goes off into the ether. Um, so a soundboard has to be incredibly efficient at capturing sound and turning it, or capturing that energy and turning it into sound. So what it allows that to be the best at doing that is for it to be very lightweight and for it to be very stiff and for it to be very strong. Um, those things tend to be counterproductive to one another. The, the more lightweight the wood is, the, the weaker that it is, which means that I have to make the wood thicker, which means it's harder for it to vibrate. So the reason we've settled on these very popular and most commonly used woods for an acoustic guitar top is because they have those amazing characteristics of being um, lightweight and stiff and very stable. Why don't we use like so many pretty woods? Uh, you know, like what we use for back and sides, you know, quilted maples or um, flame maple or, you know, we do see people use some koa on occasion or even rosewoods, you know, why don't we use rosewoods and things like that for tops on guitars? Well, the reason is, is because those woods tend to be incredibly heavy, especially like your rosewoods and your ebonies and things like that. Um, and so that when you pluck a string, it's going to have a harder time getting that top to vibrate. So you're, you're going to be wasting a lot of the energy. Uh, they do have the strength, but what they lack is the lightweight, lightweightedness. It'd be like having a, um, a sail on a sailboat that's made out of lead. You know, it, sure, it would, it would capture the wind, but it's so heavy that it just wouldn't do a very good job of transferring that wind into forward momentum. Um, and uh, the other thing we want is straight grain. We really want to have straight grain running down the length of the of the wood because what that's going to do is give us strength and prevent that top from wanting to bow uh, and it also gives us stability so the other thing like i had mentioned uh, quilted maple uh, or flamed and figured woods they're beautiful but all of that grain running in different directions is not good as far as being able to evenly distribute and um, spread out the load of the string across the top of the guitar um, so those are the reasons why we use the types of woods that I'm about to show you here. Um, so let me, with that said, kind of go across a little bit of how this works. So the top of an acoustic guitar is 99.9% .9 of the time always book matched. This goes for the back of guitars as well. They're actually made out of two different pieces of wood. Sorry, let's see. These pieces of wood almost always come to us like this. This actually sat inside of the tree like this. The tree goes up, you cut a wedge out of the tree, you split it open, and what you get is a book match and a reflection of this face matches this face. 
aesthetically it looks very pleasing. The other thing that it does is that these two pieces of wood are as close to identical as one another as they humanly can be. So that's kind of how we come to the piece of wood that we get to make a top. It's glued together, it's thicknessed to a certain thickness, and then we put braces on it, and then we actually voice those braces. That's the real magic in what makes a handmade guitar a handmade guitar to me. Um, the way that most factories do it, pretty much all factories, would be to say that they come up with just a generalization of what they like the thickness of their spruces to be or whatever species they're using. Let's use Sitka spruce in this example. Um, say it's XYZ guitars. You know, we all know the big manufacturers. We don't need to name them. Uh, and they'll say, well, we're going to run all of our Sitka spruce in at three millimeters. It's going to run through the drum sanders three millimeters. Just run it through. And that's cool. Three millimeters might be that magical spot of, of musicality for one out of every 75 guitar tops that go through. Um, and then they'll also do the same thing with their braces. They glue their braces on. There's somebody at the end of, of, of an assembly line who comes through with a chisel and they scallop the braces. They quickly chip these things down and get it more lightweight. But they're not really paying attention to how that particular piece of wood wants to be musical. Um, whereas what I do and what any hand builder does, um, because once again, this isn't really about trying to sell my guitars, it's just about talking about the craft of guitar building and what makes our instruments tick, um, is that I will glue these, t this, these two pieces together and then I'll run them through my drum sander, um, which is a machine that has a, a piece of sandpaper inside of it and I use to get a nice uniform thickness of my tops. I'll run it through and I will actually feel it I'll, let me actually, let me grab this piece over here, actually. I'll actually cut it out on my CNC machine to get it its rough shape like this. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll listen to it. I'll feel how stiff it is. I have, a, I have a, an idea of how thick a certain species likes to be. Say for me, it's Sitka spruce, and I, I use metric. Um, you know, I know that once I get to about... 2.5 millimeters, 2.6 millimeters, I'm really going to start paying attention because that's when that wood starts to have a, an amount of elasticity to it that, that tells me when it's happy. Uh, I've learned over all of the years of guitar building just intuitively where that stiffness is for my guitars, for the way that I build them. Um, and so the factories don't have time for that. You know, they, they, they're building guitars that go off out into the world and their main objective is to sell the guitar to make it sound as good as possible but the biggest thing is is they don't want it coming back for warranty work and and with these acoustic instruments they're they're living breathing things and humidity and uh, temperature fluctuations and things like that can cause these woods to be uh, to flex and go all over the place which can throw the geometry of the guitar off and next thing you know uh, I'm marking guitars and my phone's ringing off the hook because I've got you know the bajillion guitars that are having issues and the only issue really is is that people aren't really taking super good care of their instruments so in order to prevent that what they'll do is they'll make their tops a lot thicker than they need to be their braces a lot stiffer than they need to be because they don't know who the end consumer is they have no idea what I can do is I know who you are that I'm building the guitar for I can ask you like what's the life of this instrument gonna look like where do you live what's what is how cold do you keep your home uh, and I will build that guitar to be as sonically good as possible based off of what the life expectancy of the instrument is. The long way of me saying when I do this and I'm feeling it, it's the very beginning process of me voicing the guitar, not just for its sound, but for the life that it's gonna live. Um, then I also do the same thing once I start chopping up all these brace pieces, which what, I'll, what I do is I actually use a piece of wood that's from the same species. In the best case scenario, I'll actually use a piece of wood that's from the same tree. Uh, to make my braces and I'll glue those on and I'll take those down and I'll do the same thing as I continue to voice this top. It's a feel for me. I also actually use measurements. I'll, I have some jigs that I have where I'll actually put weight on the wood and I can measure how much of a, it's called top deflection, how much that piece of wood moves under a known load. Because to me that tells me a lot more than this, you know. So many people get so caught up in tap tuning, and to me that is such a, it's such a non, 
quantifiable measurement. There's something to it. Don't let me take that away from it. But it's not measurable. Um, to me, it's a feel thing. And I also can measure how much a top deflects under a known load. And that tells me a lot more. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing or me just rambling. Um, kind of some other things that I, I want to get into some of these different species that I have here and cover why um, you can't put certain species of woods in, in sonic boxes um, and say that, oh, Adirondack spruce always sounds this way or Sitka spruce always sounds this way or uh, redwood sounds this way. Um, and, by, and to do that, what I want to do is show you four different pieces of, of the same species of wood and tell you a little bit of the backstory of of that particular piece of wood. So we'll cover Sitka spruce here. Um, traditionally, this is what Sitka spruce looks like. Um, this is a small piece. It is by far the most popular wood. It's used on 90% uh, of guitars that are manufactured today, acoustic guitars, I'd say. Um, you can look at the Taylor lineup, uh, the, like the 200 series, or even the 100 series, all the way through its 900 series, or uh, paired up with Indian Rosewood, but it's Sitka Spruce top most of the time. Um, Martin D18s, uh, Martin D28s, uh, Sitka Spruce, um, J45, Sitka Spruce. Uh, very, really, it's a fantastic wood. Um, and so, but you still, even then, you can't, you can't um, say that they all have the same characteristic and sound because it's Sitka. Um, so here's a good example. This is what a piece of Sitka Spruce looks like as well as this, um, that was probably cut by somebody who was harvesting spruce just to be used um, for making products, um, to making raw lumber. Um, and then a dealer goes out and buys it, like my guy uh, in Alaska, Alaska Specialty Woods. Um, and then we'll process those billets and the pieces like this that are usable for guitar building. That wood was probably cut, you know, within the last decade and kiln dried or air dried and processed and numbered, and then I get to buy it and turn it into a guitar. Um, what's nice about that is that it gives me a very uh, clean looking piece of wood, um, but the downside to it is that I don't necessarily know the story behind it, so I have to listen to the wood and let it tell me uh, how stiff it is, uh, how glassy the tone is, um, and as I run it through my sander, I can then feel it and it'll tell me uh, where its happiness level is of stiffness. But I don't really know the story behind that particular piece of wood. I don't know, did it grow high up on a mountain where it was being blowed by wind all the time um, and it was uh, further north uh, than any other piece of spruce? And if it is, what that tends to do is give you a piece of wood that was very, it's going to be more elastic because it's being whipped around by wind all the time. But at the other side of it is it's not growing a whole lot every year because it lives in a high elevation and it's in a further northern latitude or longitude either way. I can't remember. Uh, but that tends to make a more stiff piece of wood. So I have to try to gather that information by looking at the grain that's inside of it. Um, but then to that end, you'll also have like a piece of wood like this. This is Sitka spruce as well. And you can see that it's got this weird blue color, right? Um, well, that color actually comes from, and I know the story behind this piece of wood because the person who turned it into guitar wood knows the story. So this was actually from a bridge in Alaska, uh, an old turn of the century bridge that crossed over a little river. And uh, they used spruce up there back then to make all kinds of things. So it's a little bit wider grain than the other one. But what's cool about it is this blue color comes from, um, the bridge was held together with these, you know, giant iron nuts and bolts and nails. And over the years, it leached some of those metals into the wood and give you these really cool grayish, bluish uh, streaks inside of it. And to me as a builder, what I'm interested in, yeah, the color is really cool and that'll be visually appealing. But what's really cool to me is that this piece of wood was harvested so long ago that it's had a really long life not being a living tree. So it's really, it's gonna have, it's gonna be a lot more dry, more stable. But what's really cool, just thinking about the fact that this was a bridge, that every time a car or a truck drove over the bridge, that wood was flexing and it was moving. Um, and it also was over a body of water and it was outside the whole time that it was being used as a dry good. And so during the winter time, it was really dry and really cold and frozen. 
then all the moisture inside of it was locked in it, and then it would, summertime, it would get more moist, more humidity in the air, uh, and it'd be warmer, and it did that cycle for decades and decades and decades, and by very nature, what that's gonna do is change the stiffness uh, and the sonic characteristics of this, of this piece of wood. And so that's, these two are sick of spruce, but they're going to act differently. Um, and to the further extreme of that bridge wood is this piece of wood here, which actually comes from the same dealer. Uh, there's only one log of this uh, that we know of. And um, who is it? Um, Collings Guitars and Santa Cruz Guitars have built several instruments with this. I've built three guitars, including this one here, which is, I'm in the process of finishing up now. Um, but it is Sitka spruce, but it's actually what, what is referred to as ancient Sitka, which is, you know, a, a word that we kind of just give it. Um, but it is actually a piece of wood. It was just I mean, a giant log. And I'm going to put a picture of it in, in the video for you guys to see of when he found this. But they were expanding. Alaska Specialty Woods was expanding their warehouse. Then had a big excavator and was digging out the side of this hill and found this giant log and, and being you know, wood dealers, they let's cut it open. They cut it open and it's just an amazing gray color. Sent it off to be tested so they could get some more information about it. And it was carbon dated to 3,000 years old. And they were able to show that this, the coloration inside of it actually comes from being buried underneath this glacier in this valley. And the, the, the glacier ground up all the mud and the stone and the granite and all those minerals leaked, leached into the soil and tumbled this log into the mud and, and, and seeped all of that into the wood over, all, over over those thousands of years. And we end up with this incredible looking piece of wood, which is so cool. Um, there's probably less than you know 50 pieces of this wood that's usable in the world to make guitars out of. It's by far the most expensive wood that I've ever bought for a guitar top. Here's some more of it that was is able to be used for braces. Um, but, What's cool for me as a builder is that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have built four or five instruments with this, is that I know exactly how this piece of wood sounds as a finished product. And so I can look at my notes and kind of how thick did I take it? What was the stiffness of that piece of wood that I measured? Um, and it'll tell me, uh, I can repeat those thicknesses uh, with this piece of wood because it's from the same tree. You know, the wood inside that guitar was probably sitting right here inside this tree, so it's very close to it. Um, so, but obviously, to the point of what I'm trying to get across to you is that this piece of wood, this piece of wood, this piece of wood, they're all the same species, but by their very nature, they're going to have different characteristics to them physically and sonically. Um, the last piece of Sitka spruce that I wanted to show you is something that's becoming popular now, and this is called torrified spruce. Um, and so this is, before it is treated, looks just like this. It's a light color. And it goes into a kiln. They actually cut it, process it, and they'll load all this wood into a kiln and heat it up, but they also draw the oxygen out of the chamber. And by pulling the oxygen out, what it does is prevent combustion and allows this wood to go to a higher temperature without burning, essentially, and charring. But in the process, the theory of it is, and what you can see under a you know, a magnifying glass, is that it actually pulls, A, obviously pulls all the moisture out of the wood, but it actually crystallizes and stabilizes the wood. Um, the, the, the cell walls of the piece of wood actually get stiffened up and hardened. And it looks very similar to, you know, that that 110-year-old Martin that you have, uh, or that you've, that, 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 it's got that smell to it, you know, it's got that antique smell, um, and it's got that brittleness to it. This wood, even though it's new wood, um, has that same sound and feel to it. Uh, as a builder, I know that it's going to be stiffer and more brittle, but it's also a lot more stable. Um, kind of, it's not going to shrink and expand in this direction nearly as much as um, one of these pieces here that was a tree and not, uh, as process, not as cured as this. So you'll also hear this referred to with other names, not torrified and the torrefaction process. Um, Martin Guitars is, they're, they're giving it some trademark name for like their, you know, they're doing all these pre-war Martins that they're replicating, uh, you know, anniversary series guitars where they can like age the top. It's torrifying is what it is. Um, and, and there's a lot of snake oil out there. I don't think this is snake oil. Um, 
the guitars that I've built with Torified Spruce sound different than normal Spruce. Um, and by its very nature, it just has to be different because it's, it's, you could, I mean, just the smell alone, it's got a very antique smell to it. And tap tuning only goes so far, it only tells you so much, but I'll, I'll hold this up to my lapel mic and... Hopefully you could hear that. No, I've, mind you, this is a smaller piece. Um, it makes a difference. Um, just to show you the rest of them, here's that um, bridge wood. And then some of the ancient Sitka. So I don't put a whole lot of weight into tap. Tapping only gives me a little bit of information. Um, like I said, for me, what it, what it really comes down to is, is how much stiffness does it have? Um, what's the story behind the wood? Hopefully I know that story. Um, and all of the, what I've just covered with these species translates just as importantly into all the bracewood. All of this bracewood here, I try to match. Obviously, I always match the species of the braces to the top, but what I really like to do is match the wood like it's from the same tree. Uh, and so the same thing here, this wood's going to have grain lines inside of it, and I want those grain lines to be as parallel and as tight-grained as possible because that allows me to then take those braces to hopefully um, not as thick and beefy but still retaining the strength. So I have to pay attention to not just the the species, but the actual piece of wood in order to get a guitar sonically where I want it. Um, I know that that's a lot of stuff that people don't consider a lot of the times. You know, they just, you know, you, you walk into the your local guitar center or whatever and you just go, you know, I I, I played that, that one guitar that I loved five years ago and it was Sitka Spruce or it was Adirondack Spruce or whatever it was and I loved it. So therefore, I want an Adirondack Spruce guitar. Well, so much of that can be so many things. Yes, it was Adirondack spruce, but was it that particular piece of spruce? Was it not just that particular piece of spruce, but was it uh, happened to be made by that factory? They got really lucky on that one piece of wood. Um, like I said earlier, you know, they're gonna, Martin or whoever it is, is gonna run all their whatever species through the drum sanders, all at the same thickness. And that's gonna be right for for some of those pieces of wood, but for the mass majority of them, that's not, that's not that happy spot where that wood wants to be. So it's important that you, you play every guitar that you're thinking about purchasing to see if you like how it sounds. You don't just fall in love with a certain tone wood um, because these tone woods do have very particular, very broad um, they do have very broad tonal characteristics, but they, they only go so far. That particular piece of wood is going to really tell you where it's at. I, hell, I've had, um, I've had some pieces of either the sick of spruce. I've had some sick of spruce that, you know, look perfectly fine, but then you get them. You get them in this, this place here where they're, the tops are joined and I haven't put any braces on it, and I can actually bend it into a full circle. The wood is so elastic that... It's, it, I've never actually finished making a guitar out of it because it's just a, you can tell right out of the gate that this is not going to make a good sounding guitar. Now that guitar at a factory would be processed just along with the rest of them and turned into a finished instrument and it probably sounds like shit because it's, it's not a very stiff and, and resonant piece of wood. It, it can't be and be that elastic. Um, so, you know, I take the loss, I take the L, buy another set of wood, and then make a new guitar out of it. Um, but, you know, that's just a very important thing to think about, you know. And, and I've had, like, rosewoods and, you know, like hell, like Cocobolo that I just did in the previous video. Um, some of those particular pieces of back and sides that I got out of there, some of them are incredible sounding, just tapping. And other ones are very, very cardboardy sounding and it's completely fascinating to me because I'm figuring out this stuff as I go along just like everybody um, is that no two pieces of wood are the same obviously but they can be drastically different even from the same log um, so as a builder if you're getting into building if you've been building for decades just just think about the complexities of these pieces of wood and, and what they can how they can be so different than one another and, and treat each piece of wood as its unique piece and listen to it, pay attention to it, 
look at it and let it kind of guide you in the direction of becoming mus as musical as possible. Um, we've got some other species here that I can show you, but mostly what I wanted to do was show you just those four pieces of Sitka spruce and, and show you how different they can all be than one another. And that these are obviously very broad differences. I mean, these couldn't be more different than one another for many reasons, but that also goes for all the other species as well. And, and, and it can be small differences, you know. Um, it can be the difference between a piece of wood being at the bottom of a tree versus the top of the tree, um, where, you know, at the bottom of it, the tree is swaying back and forth for hundreds of years, it becomes more elastic, and at the top, it's not. Uh, so things like that matter. And I just wanted to take uh, a little bit more time and show you just a couple other species of wood that are commonly used. Um, this one here is European spruce, also referred to sometimes as Carpathian spruce or Italian spruce, German spruce. Um, those are all very, very slightly different than one another, but they're also a lot of times intermingled with one another. It tends to be a more light colored spruce. Um, it is, I like using it because it's, it's just the color of it. It's, it's the lightest colored spruce that's out there. It is very similar sonically most of the time to Sitka spruce. It's a very right down the middle sound and I do like it. Um, it it's the cool thing on the structural end is that this, these trees tend to, especially like on the German end, uh, the Italian end, way up in the mountains, uh, in the Alps, they, the trees tend to grow a lot slower and you get super straight grain. Um, with really tight rings inside the tree, which allows me to get that guitar top just a little bit thinner while still having the strength, which is really nice. Um, another really popular tone wood, especially in vintage guitars, and it's, and it's because of the vintage guitars, is very popular today, um, is Adirondack spruce, also known as red spruce. I don't have any of that with me. I've built many guitars with it. Um, I'm not thinking if one of these is Adirondack spruce. Um, I've got one somewhere, uh, but anyway, it uh, actually, let me look. I've got, uh, yes, this is one here um, that is Adirondack spruce. It's, this is actually a really light colored one, but really nice set of Adirondack that I'm building this guitar out of. And um, it tends to be a wood, well, it's a wood that, hang on. Um, and so that Adirondack spruce is a tree that grows um, in the, on the eastern side of the United States of America um, through the Appalachians and things like that. It's, it's super easy to get, which is nice. But it's a little bit, it's a stiffer spruce and it tends to have wider grain than like the Sitkas uh, and European spruces. But because it's a lot stiffer, what you end up a lot of the times with is actually a guitar that is louder. Um, it has, it's traditionally known as a guitar tone wood that has more headroom on it. And by that, you mean like, especially for like your bluegrass style where you can just bang on it and it'll just keep giving you more and more volume. Some of these other woods, um, Sitka spruce doesn't have quite as high of a headroom. So it'll kind of like, it'll only go so far volume wise. Engelman spruce, which I don't have any here, is another wood that even is lower on that range. It tends to be even a little bit quieter. Um, yeah, and then Outside of the spruce realm, we get into your cedars. So this is western red cedar. Um, you probably can't see it in the video, but I've got a bunch stacked up there. All of this came from one log. Uh, common North American wood that is fantastic for um, finger style players, more delicate players, nylon string guitars. Um, it tends to be a lot lighter. It's softer of a wood, this dents very easily. Um, a lot of the time, these trees are huge, and so you can get beautiful pieces of wood. Like this stuff is just perfectly straight grained, has a fantastic smell, has a super boomy tap tone to it. Um, you tend to make, with this wood being so much more delicate, I actually usually make them about 10 to 15% thicker than I would a comparable piece of, say, Sitka spruce, because that wood just is not as strong. Um, this wood sonically doesn't have as much headroom as any of the spruces, but it actually wakes up a lot easier than a lot of the other species, so a really light touch will get it going. Uh, another one that's not as common, but I've used quite a bit of, is a wood called Port Orford Cedar. Um, it's actually not a cedar, it's um, a type of cypress. It's also referred to as pepper wood because it has this incredible um, 
kind of a spicy smell to it. It's, in, it's sometimes before company comes over, I'll run some of this through my sander just to make my shop smell good. It's just ridiculous. Um, but it is an incredibly stable wood with really tight grains. I mean, you almost can't even see the grains in this wood. And the grains are literally as straight as an arrow. And to that, I mean, like for hundreds of years, they've made arrows out of Port Orford cedar because the wood grain is so straight that it makes the most incredible wooden arrows. Um, it's a very, very, very stable wood, meaning that it doesn't shrink or expand uh, under humidity changes. So I'll use this a lot for people who want a guitar that's incredibly stable. Maybe it's going to be plugged in most of the time and they're going to be traveling all over the country. It's a fantastic choice for that. Now, mind you, with inside every one of these species, all of those variables that I showed you inside the Sitka spruce still apply. Um, so, so it's just as important, you know, we don't put these species into sonic boxes. Generalizations of like cedar sounds a certain way compared to spruce, definitely roll with that. But just remember, just because you played one cedar guitar doesn't mean that's how all cedar guitars are going to sound. Um, and, and that's not even to to take into consideration your back and side choices. This is just pretending that that doesn't matter at all. Um, so yeah, just a, a whole lot of stuff to think about. Um, and you can see why it's a very complex topic and why it's not an easy answer for folks when they say, hey, what, um, what, what do you recommend? Or, hey, I really want an Adirondack Spruce guitar because X, Y, Z. You know, it's my job as a builder to kind of get into more important details like this, things to consider, the unknowns. Um, that's one thing that I've learned is that, you know, anybody who tells you that there's a definitive way that you should build a guitar or the definitive woods that give you certain results, they're talking out of the side of their mouth because there's a certain part. Your job as a builder is to let the wood tell you what it wants to do. Um, and your job as a consumer of guitars is to let the guitar tell you if you like how it sounds or not. Not the name on the headstock, not whether the wood's pretty or not, because, I mean, that matters. You want to be attracted to the guitar, but if it's just purely musically we're talking about, listen to the guitar and let it tell you, is it giving you what you want? And, and this is what I find so cool about acoustic guitars versus, I think, electric solid bodies especially, is that there's just so many variables that make every single guitar completely different than the next one. Um, you know, we're taking something that used to be alive and we're essentially turning its carcass into something that is alive once again uh, via the instrument. And um, I hope that you guys have gained a little bit of information out of this quick little video. And uh, if you like what I'm doing here, please subscribe. Uh, I hope these videos don't go too long and uh, make sure you like it as well. Those always help apparently with the algorithms. And I want to do some more videos. We'll get into the backs as well. Um, you know, that's a holy God, that's a broad topic. Um, but we're going to do a lot more explainer kind of videos like this. So I hope that you've enjoyed it. And I do thank you guys for, for tuning in and watching. Thank you all.